Hi, I'm Rui Pereira da Costa, organizer of the International Eno Masters 2015. And yes, we are reaching the end of this tremendous Eno journey. I would like to thank you for being part of this adventure. It just wouldn't be the same without you. I must also share with you how grateful I am to all the speakers who embarked in this endeavor since day one, all the way back to August 2014, not knowing exactly what this crazy thing of a World Online Congress of Aeronautics was exactly, and trusting me when I said it would be awesome. But hey, I'm a dreamer after all, nothing was ever done at a scale like this, so I really acknowledge their trust, their support, their efforts and their vision. This would be nothing without their mastery. I must also thank my friend Clifford Ruddle, a big supporter, who endorsed this project right from the beginning. His words were always inspirational and a motivation boost. But I can forget my most faithful supporters, who were there all the way unconditionally. I'm of course talking about my family. My wife Barbara and my son Zé Rui and my daughter Beatriz were always there, even in those moments where everything seemed to go the wrong way, and putting up with me, with my sleepless nights, with the tremendous amount of hours this project took me, and the weight it ended up representing to the family. But they fully supported this idea since its conception, understanding the magnitude it could have, and my vision to take endodontic knowledge to everyone, all over the world, without any geographical or political boundaries for free. Crazy? I don't think so. You tell me. So this last lecture of the International Eno Masters 2015 will be a very special one, as it will be presented by no other than my mentor in endodontics, Miguel Hodge. I can say he is one of the main responsible persons for my endodontic continuous education, and he was the driving force for my enrollment in the postgraduate program of endodontics in the International University of Catalonia in Barcelona. Miguel is an outstanding person, an excellent clinician and an expert in the fields of endodontics and aesthetic rehabilitation, and a man with great vision and determination. He was responsible for the creation of the online postgraduate program of endodontics and the online diploma in endodontics at the International University of Catalonia to very innovative programs that use the advances of technology to allow dentists from abroad to reach a very high level in endodontics. Even being really busy, for he is the president of the Congress of the European Society of Endodontology that will be held in Barcelona in September this year, he was eager to participate in what he considered an excellent idea. It is a great honor for me to present you Miguel Roch from Barcelona, Spain. Miguel will bring a topic he dominates and where he excels, the conservative approach of severely damaged teeth. I'm sure you'll enjoy and it's a great way to finish this Eno Masters 2015. Please let me know your thoughts on the Congress, the lectures, the topics or whatever you'd like to comment. I truly value your opinion as this Congress was made for you. I hope you have enjoyed all the conferences and I really hope to see you soon, whether online or physically. You know, maybe this was just the beginning. Hello friends, I'm Miguel Rochcayon from Universitat de Sale Catalunya in Barcelona, Spain. And I don't know how to start, for I don't know if I have to say good afternoon, good evening, good morning, for this new format may allow everyone to attend this lecture at different times in different places. What I do want to do is thanking Dr. Rui Pereira, my good friend and colleague, for inviting me to take part in ver this very special meeting. I really look forward to seeing its big success, for I think it's a very interesting way of uh, presenting, introducing information to dentists. I will try to speak on, well, I was invited to speak on endodontic versus implants, but I will do what I do like to do best, is talk what I want. I will try to show our philosophy, our philosophy in dealing with severely damaged teeth, and during the lecture, that we are going to present, you will be able to see the way we treat this kind of teeth. The lecture will be divided in five points, in five parts. Time is limited, so we will go fast over each one of them. First topic to cover is 
what we call conservative dentistry, like swimming dentistry. Then we will move, move to adhesive dentistry. We will speak very shortly on step dentistry. We will try then to show how new problems are appearing in the more world of dentistry that require new solutions. We will talk a little bit on endo versus implants to finally, part five, show you how we manage certain types of hopeless teeth in the static zone. Why do we say that conservative dentistry is like swimming contest stream? Well, if we look to our past, we can see that, for instance, in 1665, in the city of London, the third cause of death, and it's reported in this report, in, in this page, the third cause of death was what they call teeth and wounds. Remember that when you open a chamber, what you see there, the pulp, is somehow like to a womb. And for many centuries or even for thousands of years, people thought that there were worms that were causing all the problems. So teeth problems were third cause of that. Imagine how scared could people be for having a toothache or a tooth problem. And that happened for thousands of years. Only Lately, in the last hundred years, the number of deaths for these teeth from this teeth and wombs group was reduced significantly. Well, one might thought that the introduction of new concepts so, such as radiology to dentistry at the beginning of the 19th century would have helped dentistry to improve. But in fact, when x-rays were started to be used, many lesions were discovered under teeth. And this brought to the theory of the focal infection that the name was not given by Hunter, but it started by a lecture from William Hunter in the University of Montreal at the beginning in the early 19th, in the early 19th, sorry. What he was trying to say that underneath the extraordinary nice gold work done by dentists, there were big amounts of bacteria, of bacs. Dentistry, he said, was causing infections. And that started a dark era of dentistry in general, but especially in endodontics. And only by the end of the 30s, endodontics restarted to be admitted as, some, as something scientific and was in fact the last specialty, pure specialty, to be recognized by the American Dental Association in 1964. Well, many people might think that this is history and those times had gone. But when we go to the internet, we can find websites as this one that that says that why, title Why Safe But Teeth, Dental Heroics and Necessary and Failure Prone. Who's telling this is someone called John Minichetti, speaking for the American Association of Internal Dentistry, that's what they say, and he says there is really no justification for undergoing multiple endodontic or periodontic procedures and enduring the pain and financial burden to save a disease teeth, tooth, sorry, and they also, he also says that the days are over for saving teeth till they fall out, etc., etc. Okay, this might be a single opinion of someone somewhere, and maybe we shouldn't concern. The problem is that we go to the official page of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, 
we can read something similar for they say that treatment they are speaking about dentistry is considered more predictable than bridge work resin butted bridges and endodontic treatment but this is not only in the internet because we can go to certain scientific journals and we can read things as this written in the Journal of California Dental Association in 2004 when they say that presently dental implant success rates have been clearly identified and documented in the literature which now questions the survivability and success rates of the traditional mode of therapy for extensively damaged teeth. And when you read these kind of things you can have two options. Option one, become angry. Option two, I think more logical, ask yourself, should we still treat severally damaged teeth? We have to think in this seriously and we will come back to this question later on in the lecture. Second thing I want to make clear is that adhesive dentistry works. And I will try to show you with a case. It's an easy case. It's a patient that comes to our dental school with a broken central incisor. He brings the broken piece and is treated by our resident at the time, Sebastian Villa, and now works in my office. This was year 200. Patient comes. Sebastian isolates the teeth. He cleans thoroughly. He does not prepare the surface. He just cleans the surface. He etches the enamel, then go for the dent in 14 seconds. Rinse thoroughly with water, place an adhesive, make the same preparation on the broken fragment, put all both pieces together, then he takes a bar, he drills a groove in the fracture on the fracture line, adds bonds, puts places some composite there, and finish and polish it very well. Pay attention to this broken aspect because it will help us to see how patient is getting old by the wear of the rest of the central incisor. So this is year 200. Patient's scanned after some time. We control him also with x-rays. This is 205, 206, 208, 210. Ten years later, the, the patient decides to go for orthodontic treatment. Braces are placed. Treatment is finished. This is year 2013. And the fragment is still there. And you see the word, so you see the time passed by. Addition works. You will say, okay, this was enamel. It's true. In dentin it's more difficult, but it works also not as well, not as reliable. It is not as reliable, but it does work. And if you are interested, I recommend you, I suggest you to read this paper from Angelo Putignano. It's from year 2012. And it's very clinically oriented. So it's very interesting for those interested in clinical application of dental adhesives. It's not only adhesion. We also have materials, composites, mainly also resins, that allows, allow us this, all these pictures are done, were done by students of the static dentistry program during the first three months in, in, in the school. And with these materials we were able to reproduce the anatomy, the color, the texture, the microanatomy, not only microanatomy, of teeth. So we can mimic perfectly the anatomy. So we have addition on one side, we have excellent materials on the other side. The wear is very similar to the wear of tooth structures. And if we bring it to the mouth of our patients, we are able to very well reproduce the mic micro and micro anatomy of teeth.
So instead of going for these gold foil restorations, these old classic density that does work, these were done by my father many, many years ago, we can instead try to apply new approaches. So many times when patients with extensive class 1 lesions come to us, we plan how to restore them, we clean thoroughly, and pay attention to the fact that although we have some enamel without dentinal support, provided they are not working cusps, we rely on adhesion and prefer to restore it directly without cutting those cusps, those that enamel. We add the enamel first, we extend the etching to the dentin for 10 to 20 seconds, we rinse thoroughly. We can use chlorhexidine to prevent degradation of the adhesion by methaloproteinases. We place our primer, we place our bonding, we place different layers of composite one by one, and finally we achieve an excellent static result. We are able to reproduce the anatomy of teeth with this material. We just need to practice. And what happens when we are working with root canal treated teeth? Well, there was a nice approach from Blitz and Sorota published in 1996. I was very happy to read it and we, the idea, sorry, the idea is trying to use the pop chamber to retain the restoration, avoiding more tooth destruction, preventing more risk of tooth fracture for the reduction of the heart tissue, of the remaining heart tissue of our teeth. We published a paper in 1997 on this topic, also the same year, the excellent book from Dietzi and Spreafico, Current uh, adhes Adhesive Metal Free Restoration, was published. I was the one to translate it to Spanish, it's an excellent book, I do recommend you to read it after, even after more than 10 years, 14 years. It's a really excellent book. So, when we face this kind of restorations, we can do uh, classic crowns, but we prefer to preserve more tooth structure. We always try, now we don't use the chamber, we prefer to raise the gingival floor in order to allow the easiest adhesion of the indirect restoration we will going to place late, later. In this case we cut off all the casts, probably now we would have preserved those casts. We do in median dentin sealing routinely. The lab sends us the restoration, we test it in the mouth, afterwards we prepare it. If it's made out of composite we can sandblast it. If it's made out of, of Ceramic, we might have to uh, etch it with hydrofluoric acid. Sorry, I don't know the English name. Then we clean, we place some saline, some adhesive, some composite, warm composite. We do the same preparation to the tea, to the, to the tooth surface and then we place our restoration there. We've been doing it routinely for 17 years now and it works. Now the main change, we, we, we are trying to use CAD-CAM systems. CAD-CAM system, uh, systems allows us to use different materials. We can use composites, you, you can use ceramics. We are conducing a three years clinical randomized multicenter trial on this kind of restorations with excellent super results in molars, not that good in premolars. We have to rethink how to restore molars. Premolars probably were doing too thin restorations, but it's a, a kind of restoration that works. We have published several papers on this topic in peer-reviewed journals.
So the idea is when possible we like to in certain patients that need to be treated in, in less time, on less visits, we can go for a root canal treatment. Once the root canal treatment is finished, we can do a small restoration, we can take an impression, with the impression we can go to send it to the lab or do it chair side. This was done chair side. We prefer the restoration and then the restoration is brought to the mouth and adhere to the tooth. And this can be, if you have enough time, in a single visit. So you reduce chair time to your patients and probably for you. Endodontists are not only endodontists, they are dentists also. It's a specialty of dentistry. And they have to be aware that new problems are, are appearing in the world of dentistry that require new approaches, new solutions. And they have to take part of teams that take the decisions. They have to give their opinion uh, in, when dealing with this kind of patients. Traditional dentistry used to deal with decay with caries. Polycaries patients were very common when I, when I started practicing dentistry. And remember, it's important not only to treat the lesions, but also treat the, 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 the illness. Because if we don't treat, treat the illness sooner than later, the patient will come back with no lesions. So we know how to treat with these patients, but these patients very seldom come to our offices right now. What we see more is patients coming for wear problems. It's an, there is a normal wear in teeth, but it's also pathological wear. You can have attrition, that is uh, the mechanical wear resulting for mastication or perfection function limited to contacting surfaces of the teeth. We can have Erosion, where acidic wear is involved. This kind of lesions, er, 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 erosion lesions, cause big losses of teeth and we might need to even do root canal treatment sometimes. Don't think this, uh, this is only wear. There is an acidic problem also taking part in here. Most of the times we have a combination of problems. This has some attrition and has some erosion also. We see many, many of these patients in our daily practice. And we have sometimes to do root canal treatment there because there might be involvement of, of the root canal. We have the coloration. Of course, as I was saying, palpal complications. And these patients require treatment. And this is related also with the problems we are facing now. That these patients and more of, of most of our patients are demanding from us not only treating the wear, but restoring the anatomy and the aesthetics of teeth. Aesthetics is part of our treatment goal. And we have to be aware of that. And, and the dentists have a big role to play in the game of aesthetics. And we will show it later, or we'll try to show it later. Okay, these are patients that we see in our daily basis. And we have to try to restore them, and we have to try to restore them in the most conservative manner possible. Trying to preserve tooth structure in the same way we were treated, trying to save tooth structure when we were restoring our root canal root teeth by means of overlays instead, instead of doing conventional crowns. We won't enter in detail in this topic because we have limited time or I've been told to try to limit my time for there are not real time limitations in the format that Rui Pereira decided to offer this, this process. It's the same thing we were doing with the, our overlays but we are doing them in non root and canal treated teeth. We are placing palatal veneers in order to restore the function, the length of the teeth. And if we want more static, we might go for 
uh, for buccal veneers, conventional porcelain veneers. And we come from the fourth point, endo and implants. Look carefully, I didn't say endo versus implants, I prefer to say endo and implants, for they don't compete to each other, they complement each other. Remember we were saying, should we still treat severely damaged teeth in the time of dental implants? Okay, this is a nice case from Sergei Kandler. Many lecturers are showing it, all his friends are showing it through the world because he is very kind and offers, it, offers us this kind of case. This is a patient that came to him in Nova, in Florida. You have a patient treated with a dental implant in tooth 1.4, a crown root canal treated teeth 1.6 with a reinfection. You see the infection there. The patient comes to us, well, comes, goes to Dr. Cutler, sorry, and says, okay, I have a problem here, I want my tooth extracted and I want an implant placed there. For I already have an implant placed and the implant was very fast, very easy, no pain. The cost of a root canal treatment in the USA is more like, is very high also, so price wouldn't be a, a big concern here, but, but Sergio insists that although it's a failing root canal treatment, it can be treated and it, it, he thinks it's better to try to treat it rather than go for an extraction and a, root and, and a dental implant. Finally, the patient accepts, Sergio tries, decides to go for a epiectomy apical surgery, he confirms that the lesion comes from the tip of the mesobuccal root, he raises a flap, cleans thoroughly, these are old times where large flaps were raised, and it interestingly, Sergio sees something strange here, and look, this was a successful implant, but it's mostly out of the teeth, out of the root. It's completely fenestrated. It's completely out of the root. Imagine he has a little bit of resorption there, what is not strange in dental implants, he will probably lose the whole implant. So many times we see things that we believe they are as we see them. But the real reality is very different to the appearance most of the times. Of course, we can treat this. You place some biomaterial on that, a grafting, a collagen membrane, close it, and both are working, the implant and the, and, and the root canal treated the tooth. So, don't believe everything you see because there are many things to take into account when taking a decision, a clinical decision. In the case of deciding whether to place an implant or do a root canal treatment, we have to carefully check the outcomes of both treatments, the success and failure rates of those treatments, the impact that using root canal treatments or implants will have on the functional rehabilitation and psychological effect on the patient. We have to consider the complications that may appear related to the kind of treatment we choose. Of course we have to take under consideration the cost-benefit ratio, and many other factors that uh, influence the treatment planning have to be considered prior to taking the final decision. And this is not easy. This is not easy. Remember the case from Sergio Cutler. We cannot believe what we see in the X-ray. We have to try to found sound foundations 
to find sound foundations to take our decisions. And the best thing is to try to take our, our decisions basing them on the ev scientific evidence. There are many ways to, to determine the sci scientific evidence and the, the, probably the, the best way I, I found is this one proposed by the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine from the University of Oxford, where they level the evidence from 1 to 5. The best level of evidence is that that gives you randomized clinical trials or systematic reviews of randomized clinical trials. When the, decision is, when the decision can be based on randomized clinical trials, we are very likely to choose the best option. But most of the times we can only have, we can only rely on case series. Most of implant studies are based on case series or in the expert opinion. Expert opinion, it's important of course, but it's the lowest level of evidence we can have. So be careful when basing your decisions on clinical, on clinical experts' opinions. Try to rely more in higher evidence. I won't enter in detail in scientific evidence, but I will place just an example. This is a nice paper. It was published 10 years ago in Journal of Endodontics, and it's a nice study for it's done over a huge amount of patients. They took 1,126,288 patients, so let's say more than 1 million patients, and near 1 million and a half teeth were treated. They checked the, they assessed these teeth for eight years. The patients, all patients belong to an insurance company, Delta Dental. And after eight years, after eight years, 97% of teeth were retained in the oral cavity. So, 97% of root canal treated teeth were there. There are more interesting things to read here. For instance, most of the lost teeth were lost during the first two years. And after the first two years, the complications, the problems, the lost teeth were very, very small. So once the root canal treatment succeeds or survives, for two years, it's very likely to have a big chance of remaining in teeth for the as as long as the rest of the teeth of the patient. And when we try to compare the success or survival of root canal treatment versus implants, we can see in papers this is published by Imcal. Iqbal and Sim in the International Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Implants. We can see that both therapies had overall survival rates of 94%, thus providing predictable outcomes. So, dental implants, root canal treatment are equally predictable, predictable. They have more or less the same success rate. Or, let's say they have more or less the same survivability in long run. So the decisions of using one or the other shouldn't be based on survivability, but in other concepts. We'll come to that later. Literature says that endodont root count treatment goes well, but now we have instruments, materials that allow us to do excellent treatments with without the special skills for the instruments we have now are able to follow, this is not the best case for it's not a very curved canal, but that is the one I'm showing, the instruments follow perfectly the canal and you don't need to be 
specially skilled in order to achieve good results. They prepare very well the canal and they prepare it also very well for receiving the obturation. So obturation is very easy also thanks to the use of these kinds of materials. We have many systems. Now we have systems like the reciprocating ones that reduce the risk of breakage and also reduce the number of instruments and make instrumentation really easy. I think instrumentation today it's not a problem for anyone. It might be a problem finding all the canals, locating very uh, gliding, uh, achieving a gliding path through a very curved canal, but preparing the canals it's not easy at all today. Moreover, the systems remain very well centered. This is a case by Dr. Cutler, well the case is not from Dr. Cutler, but the the micro CT scan, yes it is. In the left image you have the prepared canal, here you have the original canal, and you will see how the prepared canal perfectly follows the anatomy without transportation of the original, original canal. It enlarges keeping the position. So instrumentation is really easy now with the systems that factories provide us. We have to say that our students routinely achieve excellent results. These are all cases from our students. Our students consistently achieve excellent results. And these are all cases they routinely produce in our dental clinic in the university, at the University of Catalonia in Barcelona. And the, the nice thing of the system is that the file follows easily the anatomy. And once you have a shift glide path, preparing properly the canals, it's relatively easy. Of course, you have to follow a, a precise protocol, but, but it's not a difficult thing to achieve. Of course, there are situations as a broken file that might need different things, but, but the cases come easily. Moreover, nowadays we have an, an extra instrument that allows us to, to make perfect diagnosis prior to starting, and that's CBCT. With cone beam computer tomography, we are able to see the anatomy of the teeth, the internal anatomy of the tooth, prior to starting root canal treatment. So we know the number of canals we have, the orientation of the canals, the curvatures of the canals. We can know where we have to direct our direct our file our bar in order to minimize the, op uh, the, the access opening and with this system it's easier for us, don't think this is too big, there was an uh, obturation, no obturation here that was removed, but it's, it's very easy because we know what are we looking for and, and when you know what are you looking for it's much easier to find it. The problem is when you, you don't know what are you looking for, it's impossible you find it. We can also, the, well, this CBCT also helps us in diagnosis the, the lesions around the apexes. It's amazing, but even in vital teeth you can find periapical lesions as shown in this paper from Dr. Abella. But it's an excellent tool that helps us in our treatment planning and our diagnosis. That's why the European Society of Endodontology recently presented a position statement on the use of CBCT in endodontics and we are happy, both Dr. Abella and me, to have helped in the production of this paper. So we have new instruments, rotary instruments, we have uh, new diagnosing tools. I won't speak on root canal on, on AP locators. You all know they work fine perfectly. We also have materials such as MTA that are fantastic in, in the root canal system. For with MTA we can solve situations as perforations that before were impossible or, or very very difficult to deal with. This uh, a nice case we we did with MTA in the dental school. Later on, the patient had to have his tooth extracted for orthodontic reasons, and we 
did a histological ana analysis of the tooth and surprisingly you can we could show we could see the growth of cementum like tissue around the the MTA so so it's an excellent material and it helps us a lot all these together make us able to say that endodontic treatment is a most predictable procedure when the clinician accomplishes correct diagnosis, appropriate treatment planning, thorough instrumentation, complete obturation with coronal restoration, and always and only if he works with a compassionate and effective care. Only things you love when you do them are achieve good results. You have to put your heart in the things you, you do. If you don't put your heart in things you do, it's very difficult to achieve good results. That said, the decision to treat a tooth endodontically or replace it with an implant must be based on factors other than the treatment outcomes of the procedures it themselves. For both root canal treatment and, end, and, and implants work very well. So you can pull a tooth out to place an implant saying that the implants were better because that's not true. The decision of placing an implant or preserving a, a tooth or saving a tooth will depend in many other factors, in a pool of factors that all together will lead you in one direction or another. It all depends on tooth restorability, patient age, patient biogingival biotype, gingival biotype, sorry, root canal accessibility, buccal lingual bone thickness, all these pool of things will lead our decision planning. And always, always remembering that the clinician, always remembering the clinician that the basic goal of dental implants is not to replace existing teeth, but missing teeth. So if teeth are there, we have to make our best to save those teeth. We think that what we do is science, and being science, we have, we, we, we should think that in front of the same situation, every well-trained dentist would react in the same way. Vigress published a nice paper in 2008 in the Triple O, where she showed different, well, different cases to different group of practitioners with different specialties, endodontists, general practitioners, prostodontists, periodontists, and oral maxillofacial surgeons. And the results were surprising for, depending on the type of education they had received, their treatment decision was different. And I will stay in only one case. This is a young lady, 35, let's say 35 years old, high smile, failing root canal treatment, fold crown with some decay, long post. The question is, what would you do? And these are the results. And the dentist mainly preferred to preserve the tooth. Oral maxillofacial surgeons mainly, mostly prefer to extract the tooth and place an implant. Period the same. What surprised me more is the position of the prosthodontists. For nothing's more difficult than achieving excellent result in an anterior aesthetic tooth. it's very likely to have problems. And by preserving the tooth of the patient, you might have more chances of aesthetic success. And always remember, this is published by Doyle, Doyle in Journal of Endodontic in 2006, that although the failure rate is more or less the same both in endo and implants, the number of cases that have complications, this is survival within the intervention, it's much higher in the implant group that in the endodontic treated teeth group. And the type of complications is, is multiple. We have a lot of perimplantitis. More and more every day the, because of the new surfaces we are placing in our implants. But I will stay just in one complication, is the static complications that represent more or less 10% of the cases. That's a lot.
we have to remember that achieving excellent statics in with implants in the interior zone mainly depends on the three-dimensional position of the bone to implant of the of the implant in the bone and many times we don't have that bone to allow the appropriate position of the implant and in those cases achieving a good result is very difficult if not impossible let's see a case this case was done by our team she's a young patient medium smile she wants an implant here she has a genesia so she has little amount of bone here these are our treatment goals we plan it carefully we place the implant and this is the implant from a palatal view this is the implant this is a natural tooth more or less the same so nice result from the palatal aspect but what in the front this we expected to have our papilla here in the contact point but unfortunately the papilla is not there is significantly higher it's not a failure provided the patient is very happy with the result three years later but we did not achieve sorry we did not achieve our goal so this is much higher than this so this is not a success it is not a failure but it is not a success and doing our best to achieve success Remember that having the papilla down there depends mainly in the distance from the bone crest to the contact point. If it's less than 5 millimeters, we are very likely to achieve it. If it's more than 5 millimeters, it's very, we are, we'll probably do not achieve closing that space. But that's not the only measure we have to take into account. Also, the distance from the implant to the neighbor teeth is very important. If this, the distance should never be less than 1.5 because the, we, need, we need enough room for the tissues to grow. And if it's between two implants, we need at least 3 millimeters. If we don't have those, that space, it's better we don't place an implant there. And probably that was the case here. We thought that we had the space, but it's almost impossible to stay just there very easily the bar can move 0.5 to the right, 0.5 to the left and then we're invading the space around the implant we need at least 1.5 millimeters and probably some extra room and the only way to achieve that space will be sometimes reducing the diameter of the implant or moving apart the, the neighbor teeth by means or, or, of orthodontic treatment. If we want two implants together, remember we cannot stay just one implant. We will need, instead of one implant, I, I, 1.5 millimeters, we will need 1.5 millimeters per tooth. That means at least 3 millimeters, if more better. Here we finish the, the topic endo versus implants and I will, would summarize maybe the most important things is that both endo and implants have excellent results but interestingly root canal treatments mainly have the problems in the first two years and those root canal treated teeth that after two years our infection in, in the mouth will probably remain in the mouth and have more or less the same prognosis of a normal teeth in the mouth. On the other hand, implants have the same failure rate as root canal treated teeth, but they have much more complications during the lifetime, and those complications mainly appear after seven years of being in the mouth. Those are important things to consider when taking our clinical decisions. And we will then move to our, our last part of the lecture, 
where we will present some hopeless teeth, how do we manage certain hopeless teeth in the static zone? For we think that the endodontist has a strong role to play in the static zone. When we find a non-restorative tooth in the anterior zone, of course we have to think in the possibility of doing a surgical extraction. But we have to remember that when we go for a surgical extraction, it will for sure have, the patient will for sure have an important loss of bone, of tissue, that will affect the final aesthetics. For that reason, many techniques have been developed in order to maintain, to preserve, or to restore that loss of tissue after tooth extraction. Of course, there are situations, as the one I'm showing you, that the patient has to go for a tooth extraction. It has a big infection there in tooth 1 1, and we see that the tooth has been completely resolved. If there were no infection there, we might think in other possibilities. What we decided to do in this patient is to extract this tooth and try to do a root canal treatment in this other tooth, in, two, in, in tooth two, 1. The idea is if we extract both tooth at the same, both teeth at the same time and we place two implants at the same time, it will be very, very hard to maintain the tissue, the sound, the, the soft tissue architecture. So the idea is Try to do a root canal treatment here, see if it works. If it works, perfect. If it does not work, at least we gain time until we have this implant already in place. So that's what we do. We prepare the neighbor tooth, we fill it with sodium calcium hydroxide. We have to retain re several times calcium hydroxide there until the infection completely disappears and we extracted tooth 1-1. One, one. Here we have the picture, we remove all the infection, we prepare the implant, an immediate implant placement, we place the implant, and once the implant is placed, with the same crown, we prepare uh, a temporary crown, that it's fixed on the implant. We leave it a little bit deeper and a, bit, a, a little bit more vocal in order to avoid contact with the neighbor with the, with the opposing teeth. By doing this, we are able to preserve very, very well, I would say, the gingival architecture of the patient. In the future, when this implant is completely established, uh, integrated, we might think prior to doing the final restoration if we need to change or not this tooth. But remember, two implants together, high risk of not achieving good static results. So, let's go for another case. A patient comes to us. This patient is around 40 years old. She has been wearing these crowns for almost 20 years now. She has a sinus tract. It looks like if it came from tooth to two. We check it with a radiograph. We see an infection there. But when we do a sinus tract tracing, when we try, try to trace the sinus tract with a gutta perca, we see that the gutta perca does not point the tip, of the tip of the tooth, but the tip of the core. In this case, the patient brought the CBCT, that always helps, and we see the, the amount of destruction we have in the bone there. And remember, we have a big bone loss in the apex of the tooth, plus an infection coming also with a sinus tract from the tip of the core, of the post, sorry, of the post. What is the idea? The, idea, the patient does not want to lose the tooth and his dentist, she's Japanese, his dentist in Japan has insisted her in not to allow dentists, the European dentist, 
to pull her, her teeth out. So what we say is, okay, this tooth is very difficult to restore, if not unrestorable, but if we pull it out and place an implant, we won't be able to do an, impl an, an immediate implant placement, so we risk losing the gingival architecture. So we accept to go for a root canal treatment. We place MTA both to fill the apical part of the canal and also to fill the perforation. We see that there is very little tooth uh, remaining. Here we see the white MTA. It doesn't matter whether it's white or black, it will for sure stain the tooth in the future. So we will try to keep it away from the crown. We see there is very little tooth remaining. So here we place a post, a fiber post, and we do a bulk restoration with composite because there is no problem for it's a flat surface, surface here. <coughs> we use a silicon key in order to prepare it and we're done. In a single visit we've done all this procedure. The patient goes home and six months later she comes to us. Of course the crown, the, the restoration is not very nice. There, is no, there are no signs of infection and in only six months there is an excellent improvement of the bone of the bone quality. If we had to go for an implant now, the prognosis would have been much better than if we had done the extraction six months before. But now, as long as the root is the, the, the bone is healing, the patients asked us for other options rather than extraction. Of course, we have to go for the root canal treatment of the rest of the teeth of the patient. We also treated this one, this one, and two months ago we treated also tooth 1-1. One, one. Okay, this has been treated also for there were infections here that we can, could see clearly on the CBCT that I'm not paying. Okay, if we are not going to do a surgical extraction, we might think in doing an orthodontic extrusion. What does that mean? We need to we need to place a crown there, and in order to place a crown, we need what we call ferrule effect. We need at least 1.5 to 2, better 2 millimeters of sound tissue over the gingival margin all around the tooth. So let's go for another case. We have a patient. She comes complaining for her dentist. She had a temporary crown here and she had a crown here that had fallen several times. So she does not want back to her dentist for she says that she, she don't want to have more problems with the crown. So say or fix it well or remove it, but I don't want to have problems every certain months in this tooth. So the idea is, are we able to restore this properly uh, with a good prognosis? Unfortunately, with a crown not. It's not a matter of doing a post, a post and core, and a crown. We do not have rules. So, we must go for extraction, option A, or we can try to gain rule by orthodontic extrusion. What kind of orthodontic extrusion? Probably a fast orthodont orthodontic extrusion. We want to pull the tooth down without pulling the tissues with the with with the tissue with the with the root. That means one millimeter pulling one millimeter more or less per week. If we need four millimeters, it will be four weeks plus the an extra two three months to stabilize the tissue. That's well described in a paper from the group of Marco Ferrari, when he insisted that the best way of cheating rule is not by surgical crown lengthening, that it can be done sometimes, but mainly by means of orthodontic extrusion. <coughs> Those interested in they can read this paper, it's very interesting. From, sorry, from <coughs> Anay Ramirez explaining also this problems of post length. Post is not as important as for room. Well, we come from here, we do a root canal treatment there, we start our orthodontic extrusion, <coughs> and that's where we finish. 
Look, we went from here to here. This has good prognosis. This is predictable. For here, the crown will be retained, and we still have enough root to achieve good results. And the static result is also very well. This is a five years recall. <coughs> this is another example. This patient comes to us. She falls in the kitchen. She broke two, two teeth. And those were moved also. We see she comes with the fragments in the hand. Here's the fragment of tooth to two. And what can we do there? We take its rays, we see, we take different rays in different uh, angulation in order to determine whether we, there is fracture or not. Tooth are vital, there is no pulp exposure. And the idea is, we, as we cannot isolate this properly, at, we, at least we use Expacil in order to stop bleeding. And we try to cover the dentin with some adhesive and a little bit of, of flowable composite. This is one week later and now we have to think in what to do. There's no room for a crown. We can do crown lengthening but it still will be very difficult to restore here. So I think sometimes the problem become opportunities. And we explain the patient that she's a class 2 division 2 so she might thought in going for an orthodontic treatment that would improve her occlusion, it Im would improve her aesthetics, and it allow it would allow us to properly restore these teeth, making them more reliable in the future. And that then she accepted the treatment, and with the orthodontic braces, we went from here to here. We gained room for the restoration. We also extruded a little bit the tooth. The tissue was extruded also, so we had to cut the tissue a little bit. But now, other problems appear. The tooth was vital at the beginning, there was not exposure, but now we have two orthodontic, le uh, two apical lesions. We have to go for root canal treatments in both teeth. We only do root canal mm. treatment in this kind of teeth when we see signs or symptoms of necrosis. If not, we prefer to stay with pulp vitality, but we have to check it carefully in a, in, 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 in a regular basis. And there's a final case at the beginning with composite. We wanted to go to place some veneers there. Unfortunately, she didn't want the veneers or she couldn't afford them, so we placed direct composites and that's the final result seven years later. Eight years later, sorry. <coughs> Let's see another case. It's an interesting case. It's an implant case. This patient went, this patient went to the period department of the surgery department in our school and they decided to place an implant here in tooth to two. She has a natural tooth here, natural tooth here, implant here. They placed a temporary and told us, we remember my department is not only endo, it's restorative plus endo. So they sent it to us, say, please restore the implant. What should we recommend here? Not to, to do an implant. Remember, the distance from the bone crest to the contact point is far beyond five millimeters. So it's almost impossible to close this gap almost impossible. So we propose something strange for the patient. Do a gingival graft there. Model the graft with the pontic and do a conventional bridge. That was our proposal. But the patient said, no, no, I want my implant restored. And she complained to the, to the direction. And the director told us that we should try to restore the team plan in order to avoid more problems to the school. Problems to the school. So we thought on the case carefully and we know that the best way to gain bone, the most predictable way to gain bone, is by using teeth to gain that bone. 
And provided we had teeth there, we have one root canal treated tooth here, another root canal treated tooth here, we decided to try to do some tooth extrusion here and here in order to bring the crest down. And the orthodontist start a slow tooth extrusion. Here is different. We want the bone to come down with, with the tooth, through the tooth, and that means that the extrusion is one millimeter per month instead of one millimeter per week. And you see that as long as the bone is coming down, the soft tissue is always coming down, filling the gap we had here in our temporary restoration. Once the extrusion is finished, we leave it three months in order to stabilize the tooth and tissues there. And we are able to go from this situation in the left to the situation in the right. So, <clears throat> it is important we as endodontists know that the best way of gaining bone in the arterial zone is through root canal move. I, uh, sorry, root movement. And most of the roots we have to move, move need root canal treatment. <clears throat> Here's the final case, one year later. Anyhow, sometimes we know that even if we want to extrude our tooth, our tooth won't be viable for res retaining a crown. Even in those situations we are not able to save the tooth, we can think in instead of doing a surgical extraction, doing orthodontic extraction. is pull the tooth out, but pull it in a way that we gain tissue in order to improve the result of the nice restoration, either a bridge or an, or an implant. This is well detailed by, by the group of Dennis Tarno that say that when we move the tooth down with uh, slow extrusion, we gain 70% of the bone we expected to win, but gaining a 70% of the expected bone to win is a lot of bone. So it's a very useful way of gaining bone. <clears throat> Let's see it with a case. This patient comes to us for a routinary visit. It's published in, in all surgery, I think. She comes to our office for a, a checkup, and you see there is a decay here. But she noticed something strange in the front teeth. And we, when we take an X-ray, we can see a very extent invasive cervical resorption. Sorry, I had to think. It's grade three, grade four. So. We think we cannot save this tooth, it's a tooth to be extracted. She's only 23 years old at that, at that time, and the options are two. First option is leave the tooth there, and sometimes they stay, we don't know why, but it might stop there, but it's very likely to be broken or to be worse. So maybe it's interesting to, instead of waiting for the tooth loss, trying to use the tooth to improve the situation for the next restoration that will be either a bridge or an implant. So we tell her to go with for tooth extrusion. Remember these teeth, this kind of the, the, the teeth suffering this kind of, of pathology. Invasive thermical resorption usually maintain the pulp vitality. So you don't need to do root canal treatment here. You start pulling the tooth down. It's a low, slow orthodontic extrusion. And once you see how the lesion is coming out from, from, from the bone, and at the very end, we will be able to place a, 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 an implant there with a better result for we have gained a lot of bone with the tooth extrusion. So we can use our roots to gain bone. This is a patient that comes to us 
She is very angry for they have tried to restore this tooth with a post and core several times. And last time she was in a, in a very important meeting. The, the tooth came out and she came as an urgency to our office for first time. This uh, thin biotype scalloped, so there is it is a short root, so no way of, of using the root for a for a crown, as in the case we showed some some cases before. So it's a tool that we decided to go for extraction and implant. The problem is that when you have this scalloped bone, this scalloped tissue, usually the bone is not at three millimeters of the gam, more or less 2.6, 2.7 millimeters from the gam as usually, but much higher. So placing an implant here would mean that we have to put the implant very deep inside. And we want the implant to be placed more or less at three millimeters from the, from the gingival margin. That would be around here. So maybe we would need to graft, and instead of grafting, we decided to improve the bone quality by a tooth extrusion. So we place braces to this patient, and we started a tooth extrusion. And one we had, once we had gained enough bone, we placed the implant. This is not finally placed because this has to go just in here, just during the insertion of the implant, not the final position of the implant. We have to put an implant of a diameter that, la that allows us enough room <coughs> for the papilla. And this is seven years later, seven years later. Good static result, good tissue preservation. And that's because we improve the bone, the amount of bone and the quality of the tissue by using the root of the patient. Sometimes there is no option of orthodontic extraction. There are situations where we find teeth that cannot be maintained. And the typical case is dental ankylosis. This a young child, I think he was maybe 12 years old, 10, 10 to 12 years old, I can't remember now. The patient had an abortion the tooth was re-implanted, replanted, and now he has an ankylosis. He's starting to grow, and, and as he's starting to grow, we see that all teeth continue, follow the growth of the bone, except the ankylosed one. When this happens, if the ankylosis happens after the peak of growth of the patient, then this happens very slowly and we can do a, a veneer with composite veneer or porcelain veneer and it will take many years until you see differences in the gums. But if it happens before the peak of growth, the pubertal peak of growth, then we have many chances of having this gum very high in respect to the rest of the, of the tooth. Uh, so we need to do something, and there are two things we can do. An interesting thing to do is a tooth decoronation. This has been well presented by several authors, and and you 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 have to know as in the land is that you have several ways of gaining bone. You can gain bone by autogenous bone grafting, by guided tissue regeneration, by decoronation by orthodontic extrusion and by destruction osteogenesis. And these two, the coronation or orthodontic extraction, need the help of an orthodontist, uh, of an endodontist most of the times. <clears throat> Malgrem is an expert in rich preservation and the coronation. She is the one, as far as we know, who promoted the use of this technique. She will be in the meeting of the European Society of Endodontology in Barcelona in September 2015 and I look forward to seeing her lecture. So the idea is when the, the tooth initiates 
an intrusion is not a real intrusion, it's the rest of the teeth moving down. Then we have to raise a flap, cut the crown one, two, one millimeter below the bone crest. We, if there is some gutta perca there, we have to clean it. And if it not, if there is not, maybe it's good also to use a file there to promote bleeding. Then we close the flap, and periodontal fibers cover that area, and as they cover that area, it's not clear why, but as long as the rest of the tooth follow the the ridge, the alveolar ridge in the growth, the alveolar ridge also also grows here. This after three months. This after eleven months. And we realize that the growth is there, therefore we need to cut the pontic here. We, the patient went through orthodontics, now the orthodontics is finished and we have a Maryland type bridge, but almost every year we, we need to take the bridge out, cut the composite a little bit and replace it until the peak of growth finishes. This is the situation three years later. You can see that the gum is here. We have to remove it, cut it a little bit, and replace it in, its, in the mouth of patient. This patient has psychological deficiencies and she, he has not very good periodontal health. But it's a way of gaining bone. So the prognosis of an implant here now will be much better than had been in case we had done nothing or had extruded, extracted the tooth. When a patient with ankylosis comes, sorry, when a patient with ankylosis comes, we have to realize most, most, most of them, most of those ankylosis has happened for the patient had a replantation of an avulsive teeth in not the best situ conditions. And when that happens, we have to think always in an autotransplantation. In this case, the patient was a class two division one. That's the normal situation. Most of the patients that had abulsions have this kind of, 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 of angular division. And many of them need extractions, and many of them even lower extractions. So when what this happens, we always ask the orthodontist, will this patient need extractions in the lower mandible? In this case, they told us yes. So as long as they told us yes, we started to control the growth of the second premolar, that's, which was the one to be extracted, and it, was two, when, and it had two-thirds of the root developed, then we extract the central incisor, we prepare with bars a space for the, the transplantation, we take the lower premolar, we place it there, fix it with sutures, and this is three weeks later. Of course, we cannot leave it with that as that, so the patient even went through orthodontic treatment because the tooth is in a very well condition, we cut the tooth a little bit in order to improve the occlusion. We place some composite. This kind of teeth, almost 100% of the time, had a calcification of the pulp. And that's, that's good, for it means it's healed. And this situation, 10 years later, You see it. So the message we want to send you is many times when dentists face a situation like this, the patient many times finishes like this. And what we want you is to rethink prior to extracting teeth. Give teeth a chance. And you as endodontists are the most important people in trying to save teeth. So let's go for our last case. No, but maybe it's not the last.
we will do an extra one. Okay, this is a patient that comes to us. It's a tooth fracture, anterior zone. You see the fracture there. These cases are easy cases if you know what to do. <clears throat> this is 10 years later. It was an easy case. Just splint the teeth, reposition the teeth, splint the teeth, root canal treatment because it was a lateral luxation here, apic, apex fixation without treating the apical fragment in the other one, easy treatment, excellent static result. It's published in Dentotraumatology. There are many cases like this. Remember, good diagnosis leads to good results. The patient had an accident, anterior teeth broken, we split them and they heal. Easy results. So, endodontics are very important when deciding when to do in dentotraumatology. And dentotraumatology is one of the main causes of problems in the anterior zone. Because we know that root canal treatment works, but, it, but it's much more than root canal treatments in endodontology, remember. And you have to study, and you have to be part of the team for cases like this might come to your office. This is a patient that went for orthodontics in our school, the orthodontists so strange anatomy in this tooth, they took an x-ray, they, they saw that it was really, really strange. We diagnose this as an dense indente, so we know that we have pulp in here, and this is the invagination with no pulp. The tooth was viral. But there was an apical infection because the apical infection didn't come from the pulp but from the canal of the invagination. So if we know this and we have the tools to diagnose on a microscope to treat, we can prepare the central canal, fill it with MTA, and one year later the patient comes to us, this is published in Journal of Endodontics, with the tooth completely vital without lesion. So there are many things we can do for our patients in the anterior zone. This is a young child, he was 19, not a child. He, he came to our office for a checkup and we saw a reddish image in here. Maybe some years ago we some years, 20 years ago, maybe I wouldn't be able to diagnose it. But now, when I see that, I first thing I think is in a cervical invasive resorption. We can see it in the X-ray, we can see it also in the CBCT, you will, it will appear there. You see it there. It's a huge, it's a huge lesion. But remember, the pulp is intact, so it's vital. So what can we do? We can raise a flap. We clean the lesion. Well, we first isolate the lesion. It's better not to touch because preventing is protecting the pulp but it's very thin. So we have to clean the tissue, we isolate it, and to clean the tissue we use trichloroacetic acid, 90% trichloroacetic acid, acid, sorry, it's in Spanish. And once we clean it, we go for a regular composite there. It has to be well polished because it will be a little bit under the cam. The patient is under orthodontics. 
So we will do a little bit of tooth extraction in order extrusion in order to allow the composite to be out from there. And this is the final <coughs> situation of the patient. Some elators, not very good hygiene. We still might have some composite down here that is causing some inflammation, but the situation is much better than it had been without doing nothing. So we've seen that conservative dentistry is like swimming canter stream. but it's still alive. We have seen that dentistry, adhesive dentistry works. We've seen that we have new problems, that, that new solutions are available. That we should speak not of endo versus implants, but of endo and implants. And hopelessly, teeth in the aesthetic zone can give hope. Well, the lecture is finished. I hope you have enjoyed it. I don't know the way we will deal with the questions, but if you have any question, please try to mail them me or through, through Rui Pereira. And we will be pleased to try to make clear those things that were not clear enough. And what I do want to do is inviting you to the next meeting of the European uh, Society of Endodontology that will take part in take place in Barcelona in September 2015. I think it's a nice place to meet. It's a nice meeting with nice with, with great lecturers. With uh, I think it will be a great experience. So we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much for your attention.